Hey, good morning. Or good morning. Jeez. Good evening, everybody. JD here for a special edition of Fish with JD TV. And this might be the most important one you watch ever because this has everything to do with the future of the Central Valley salmon fishing. And let's face it, there's no one who's going to say the fishing has been good. And it really hasn't been good in a long time. 2000, uh, let's see, was it 13? We had a bunch of jacks. I think that was, that was a, you know, we caught some numbers, but it's been a long time. And the question is, will the Central Valley's Chinook ever recover? And uh, there's, it's, it's complicated. It's very complicated. So um, the, uh, there's a big meeting coming up and we're going to get into that, but I'm going to bring James Stone, president of NorCal Guides and Sportsman's Association in here to help you understand how these seasons are set. And some of this info is going to blow your mind. I mean, it's just, um, th there's a lot to this process that I still don't even understand, let alone the general public. And I'm pretty heavily involved. So um, I think you're going to have uh, kind of your mind blown by this. And it's it's pretty sad and scary all at the same time. So um, before I bring James in, uh, we're going to try to just get through the basics of this really quick. And then you guys down below on various, uh, you know, YouTube and Facebook, you guys can uh, type in some questions and comments and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. So without further ado, let's bring in NCGSA Prez, Mr. James Stone. What's up, buddy? How are you doing, JD? I'm good. I've been crawling around on boat floors today, uh, installing, pulling out dry rotted floors and re reinstalling diamond plates. So I'm a little sore, but I'm good. Um, so let's, let's just get right into it. Um, we have a very important meeting coming up on March 2nd that we need everybody to be at. And it's, it's a virtual meeting, so you don't have to be there, be there. And uh, it, it, it has to do with setting our seasons and we'll get into that, but let's first take a look and, and, and hopefully you can help everybody here understand how, our seasons are going to be set because that process is going to start real soon. Uh, it always starts with the ocean and then we get to the, uh, the inland uh, stuff. So let's, let's start with how do we get our ocean season set? Does that seem like a, a logical place to start. Yeah. I mean, we can, uh, we can, we could definitely start there. I mean, a lot of people are always confused on how the season setting process kind of actually works. And uh, when you start, when you start the season, um, you, you're basically, we're, we're coming into the start of the season right now, which uh, is the end of February when all the data is finally crunched and uh, we hit the data on the head and then we bless it and we say, oh man, I hope this is the best educated mm -hmm. guess um, because um, we're wrong a lot of the times on the data. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, just being brutally honest, um, not disrespectful, just brutally honest. Um, we have missed escapement now 75% of the time in the last 15 years. 11 out of 15 years, we've completely missed escapement. Um, okay. and almost, before, you, before you get into that, let's let's describe that. Give, give everybody what escapement means. Yeah, so escapement is the fish that return from the river are deemed to escape. Return to, to the, the river, river. Yeah. or to the hatchery okay. in some systems. It depends on the system. So escapement on the Klamath and the Trinity is natural spawners only, which is excluding all hatchery stocks. Mm. Okay. Okay. And that floor minimum is 40,700, which we'll get into later. And then the Sacramento system is floor minimum 122,000 three through five year olds as as high as 180,000. I've never seen it uh, reach to 180,000, but uh, I, we're, we're going that direction um, because we keep missing the minimum number. But anyway, getting back to um, how this season is set at the end of February, let's just do the timeline as an overview for everyone real quick on the months of February, March, April, May. So you have February to where all the data is compiled, it's sent forth. And then on March 2nd, or normally the end of February, the state of California representatives give all that information out to the public. And then 
you have that data and you go to lunch and then you come back from lunch and then you are to give your advice as anglers, commercial fishermen, charter boat fleet, recreational fishermen to the PFMC Salmon Advisory Subpanel members. And there's four of those members on March 2nd that will normally sit in front of the room and you give them the best season um, that you would like to see. For example, I would like a one fish limit in the ocean. I would like a three fish limit in the ocean. I would like unlimited fish every day I go fishing. Um, you know, that's not unrealistic. However, I'm, uh, I'm being a little sarcastic, but you can, you can, you know, it's a public process. So you can ask for what you want and you can tell the department and the state and the federal government, what you've experienced or what you're seeing and your experiences and what your recommendations are to save the species, to save the inland fishery, to save escapement, to prevent the fish from getting listed, to prevent lawsuits from coming, um, to advocate for water. I mean, there's so many different angles that you can um, argue for salmon and that's why they are such an in interesting dynamic. Uh, but through that process in March, after they give all that information and then you give all your feedback to PFMC the next week, March 6th or 7th, then the PFMC Council starts and the Salmon Advisory Subpanel starts in this STT, the Salmon Technical Team, which are all the people that run the model and determine the output of the season and confirm the dates that the Salmon Advisory Subpanel gives, the SAS, to the STT, and then it's blessed by the council. Now, I hope I didn't confuse everyone already. <laughs> well, let, let's back up. So, PFMC, Pacific Fisheries Management Council, just for everybody. And, and who is the PFMC? So the PFMC, I believe, uh, don't quote me, but I'm going to guess, I believe it's 15 members. It could be 16. I could be making a mistake. I think it's 15 members. Um, and I know there's a tribal position that is elected by the tribes on the West Coast between Washington, Idaho, Oregon, and California. There's um, a Coast Guard position. And then there's a NOAA fisheries position. So there's three. And then I want to say that there's three people from each state. And that would be 12 plus three is 15. Um, so three California representatives. The current chair is Mark Gorelnik, um, who's also the president of Coastside okay. Fishing Club out of Half Moon Bay. Okay. And uh, he used to be on the SAS. And then there's um, Bob Dooley, I believe, and Louis Zim, uh, who are uh, from a little bit further south. Um, and they represent the California fishery as a whole um, on the council, and they're appointed by the governor. Okay. So now the council, this conglomerate of uh, various um, folks from different states and different user groups, what sort of power do they wield? I would say the highest um besides the federal government. I would say the federal government is larger than them because it, it's a federal entity of the season setting process when you're managing a piece of wildlife or fish that crosses international waters. Okay. So this is a federal process that is um, overseen by a lot of checks and balances and is a very, very good public process. Okay, so... Um... PFMC, uh, sort of, um, we're doing the Cliff Notes version here, sets the recommendation for the ocean season, correct? That's correct. So I'm After one of the- a long PFMC, process, by the way. Correct. So I'm one of the PFMC SAS members. I'm one of the four that is appointed by the state of California Department of Fish and Wildlife to represent you as members of the public for the recreational fishery, for the sport fishery specifically the ocean sport fishery. Um, that's my job is to represent you and to advocate for the best possible situation for access, opportunity, season settings, dates, so on and so forth. And so 
Uh, there's also a commercial rep, there's a charter boat rep, and then there's another Northern uh, representative. Uh, Jim Yarnell is the representative on the SAS that represents the sport fishery, and he's been doing it for a number of years. I've learned a lot from him. And then the charter boat rep is Johnny Atkinson. He does a great job, a uh, great representation for his charter boat fleet. And then uh, used to have John Keppen, but now George Bradshaw, who's the president of PCFFA, the commercial fleet. And right. George is their new representative, just starting his first year. Uh, but he's been around the council process for years and is uh, very intelligent and uh, understands the species very well. So the SAS gets in a room, the four of us, with members of the public and start crafting a season and after we start crafting a season, according to the numbers that were given at the March 2nd meeting with the public input from March 2nd meeting, then we will craft this season and give you three alternatives in March or three options that would work that are blessed by the state, blessed by the federal government and by the council. We have to leave the council process in March with three alternatives of three options of ways that we could craft a season in the ocean with protecting the escapement of 122,000 in the sack and whatever the minimum floor is, 40,700 natural spawners for the Klamath Trinity. So then we come back to the general public in California for another public meeting. Right. And then after that public meeting, then we go back to the public process of the council for another week. And it's literally 10, 12 hour days uh, with, with the crew. We are working nonstop on trying to do everything we can to craft the seasons because it's, it's, it's very difficult. And it's um, you can look at it from a very micro perspective uh, perspective when it comes to all the different details in the model. And we might talk about that tonight, okay. but uh, let's uh, let's cut to the meat. So let's talk about how we have not reached escapement uh, since we defined that. 11 out of the last 14 years, is that correct? 11 out of the last 15. 15 years. So, and, yeah. and those of us who have fished in the rivers, uh, that comes as no surprise. So what is the cause of that? Can we? Well, I would say the number one cause is water. Yeah. <laughs> so, Back I mean, water, but, I mean, you know, we've got to be completely honest. And, and there's a lot of people that get offended on my directness or my passion uh, specifically government employees, they get too personal with uh, my demeanor towards the way that I direct myself, but I'm watching people lose their homes. I'm watching guides go out of business. I'm watching guides have to leave their families and travel out of state to just go track down any business because there is none anymore. Uh, yep. People are being forced to sell their homes. They're being forced to move to different areas, move their children into different schooling systems. It's just a big old mess. And, you know, okay. we, we've watched, as you know, JD, we've watched a $90 million inland fishery go to $2 million of economic output. And now everybody's just turning a blind eye to the inland fishery and escapement. And that's sad. Right. Okay. So that brings us to this meeting coming up on March 2nd. And this is, this is where it really gets important. Um, we need everyone to show up to this meeting and I have, let's see here, I've got on a banner. Da, 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 da. Here it is, March 2nd, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's uh, follow the NorCal Guides page on Facebook, and, and uh, we will uh, try to get this out to everyone. But um, you can go to www.wildlife.ca.gov and then uh, search for, what is it, ocean fisheries or something? They don't make it easy, but you can get a link to this <laughs> webinar. And uh, there's also a way to um, submit comments if you don't want to uh, to uh, you know go on there and live. Well, it's not not in person, but uh, uh, you can write a comment to uh, the the folks there at uh, the state and tell them what you think about the fishing. Now, one of the things that we have been talking about lately here with our organization is. The fact that we have not reached escapement, and again, that has, it's a million causes, right? We have habitat loss, no water, yada, yada, yada. The hatcheries aren't doing their thing. 
the, you know, mismanagement, blah, 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 blah. But there's also this thing about the, uh, the ocean escapement and the models. So why don't you, as quickly as you can, kind of give us the, the numbers from uh, last year and what you know this year. And uh, we can share your screen if you have it there. And you can kind of go through this whole process for us so people can see the numbers. Because this is the part that's going to kind of kind of shake you up a little bit. So you got uh, able to get your screen on there? Yeah, give me a second here. I'm going to, um, yeah, let me, let me share it right now. Okay. Here we go. All right. Yeah. So here we go. All right. So everybody yeah. should be able to start seeing the logo and you can see up here. I'll highlight the top for you. Um, but this is the salmon season setting process. So what we do in, in the March meeting at the March meeting, you're going to hear is you're going to hear the um, head of CDFW Ocean Salmon Project who used to be Brett Cormos for over a decade, but he's moved on to a new role. So it's going to be either Pete McHugh or Marcy Remco or uh, somebody from CDFW who's very well astute on the Ocean Salmon Project. Uh, but ocean abundance is calculated by multiple factors, including harvest, escapement, hatchery, and nat natural artificial mortality. Jack escapement is also the largest variable in adjusting the abundance deviation. So the more jacks that come back the year before, as in 2021, that just came back this past fall, you need a big jack account to, to determine that that means there's a lot more fish out in the ocean that are going to be three-year-olds next year. So when you have a lot of jacks come back to the river, that's a good sign that there's a lot of three-year-olds out there. And it will be a good sign that the second year, there should be a good, decent amount of four-year-olds out there. But we didn't have that last year. Well, we didn't have that. We had a very few jacks come back. We had a few. We had a uh, about a week where a little flurry of them came through the Sac River. Uh, there was no fishing on the feather besides a few people trying to float down into the outlet with lethal temperatures and just uh, very poor fishing. There was a few days where a couple of people caught fish, but you know there wasn't there wasn't more than you know two three hundred fish caught out of the outlet this year, which is a really, really low number. Um, the American was piss poor too, as everyone knows. So everything. Um, knows. Yeah. It was just very, very, very bad fishing. The last two, three years have just been just terrible. Um, anyhow. So that's how the ocean abundance is calculated. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to type it in here so that people can see it. But uh, last year was around and give or take, I want people to understand that these numbers, I'm rounding them up and just getting close for you so that you can get an idea. But last year was 279,000 ocean abundance, roughly, okay? Was the was the forecast. That was the forecast for the ocean abundance, correct. And, is, and, and they use a model for this that, that factors in, like you say in their paragraph there above, jacks and all kinds of different stuff. And 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 let's be let's be fair here that, it's impossible to accurately guess how many salmon are swimming around out in the ocean. Um, yeah. That being said, we have um, <laughs> our model hasn't been working very well either. So, okay. So that brings us to the forecast was 279,000 salmon, not in the river, but swimming around out in the ocean. Okay. Correct. Next. And that's, that's 2021, right? Correct. 279,000. So then NOAA fisheries last year. So, uh, we knew how bad fishing was last year, and we, this is what we heard one year ago, and I sounded the alarm, and so did you, and so did half, three quarters of our board members. Everyone says, this is terrible. It's going to be horrible next year. This is, this is really bad. We haven't seen numbers like this since 2007 before the collapse. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, we're, we're not meeting escapement. We wrote a huge letter to... NOAA Fisheries, CDFW, and everyone sounding the alarm that this is bad. We had a group that told us that if we didn't make escapement of 122,000, that they're going to file a petition to list the fish. And then none of us can fish for them ever again. And our group is obviously against that because we want to go fishing for these fish. 
but there are people that are heavily concerned on the survival of the actual species. And when you look at the numbers that we've missed escapement 75% of the time in the last 15 years, you're just asking for the fish to get listed. And it's almost like some people might want it to get listed, Um, but it's just terrible. Um, But, you know, the only other thing that can happen to get change, it seems like, is lawsuits. Um, But, you know, that's that's the only way we manage anymore is the fear of a lawsuit. If it's we're not scared of the lawsuit, we're definitely not trying to do what's right for the industry and for the publicly trusted resource or the species. Anyhow, okay. don't get me going. So no fisheries, no fisheries then comes in. All right. And they say to us at the SAS in March. Uh, We recommend, as you always know, an escapement minimum of 122,000 to 180,000 fish. You have to barely meet the 122,000 for a three-year geometric mean. Otherwise, the fishing is considered, we we hate the term, but overfished. And that term needs to get changed. But that is the technical term if we don't have escapement of... 122 for a three-year geometric mean, then you go under the de minimis factor and we start going under a lot of different constraints through the model process. And that escapement number will then be raised by NOAA fisheries every year. For example, last year, I want to say it was like a hundred and it was 122,000 last year, but um, the years before it was 137. Um, and a year before that it was 142 or 143 because Mm -hmm. we kept missing escapement. So they kept raising it up to make sure that we made escapement of a minimum of 122. So this is three and five year old spawner fish. Now also in that model, then they give us a floor of the Klamath Trinity and they tell us how many natural spawners Sorry, how many natural spawners is the minimum that we have to release into the river? So if you know that you have to put, you know, back 40,700 here and you have to put back a minimum of 122, okay, now you start figuring out, okay, where are my harvest rates on my ocean harvest and and, and then I can figure it all out. So what you do is you go like this. You take 279,000 okay. minus For the forecast 122 yep. because that's the minimum you have minus 40,700. So those minus are both the- river oh. harvest. Okay, so let me just, let's just make sure everybody's with us. 279,000 is the forecast. 122,000 for the Central Valley, not including the McCullamy, is how many we need back to meet minimum escapement. And then you also have uh, 40,700, which is the minimum natural spawners that need to make it back to the Trinity Klamath system, correct? Correct. Okay, carry on. So minus river harvest. Now in the Sac Valley... Um, there's only one, there's only a couple of ways that we're getting river harvest. Okay. We're one, we're recovering code wire tags through a creel monitoring program, which is CDFW that they have multiple different sectors. It's like, I don't know, eight or 12 sectors. I think the last, the time that I talked to them about how many sectors, but it's from the, uh, Benicia bridge, Carquinas bridge, all the way up to Rio Vista, Rio Vista up to Sacramento or Knight's Landing, I think it is, then Knight's Landing to Red Bluff Diversion Dam and then Red Bluff Diversion Dam up and then Verona up to uh, Gridley and then Gridley up to the outlet hole and then the American River is a sector as well. But there's all these different sectors and then they go creel them one weekday and one uh, weekend day and then they plug it into that algorithm and they touch about... um, you know, five, three, four, five percent of the total fish caught is what they estimate. And And they they put it in a a formula and they extrapolate it out and they say, okay, you caught this many fish. And when they don't know. Just in my personal experience, um, 
I would say that number's got to be off or, or very inaccurate. Um, okay, so 20 it's way off. The, it's, 20, it's way off. 22 it's years of guiding the Central Valley for Kings every year from 98 till 2020. Um, I bet I got Creel service or Creel checked under 20 times, once a year, about average of once a year. And that's a guy who was on the river, you know, 100 plus days. So um, that's just my two cents. I'm not so sure it's super accurate. But anyway, go on. So let's let's keep keep this flowing because we got a lot of questions people pouring in. So, OK, so you got the, uh, the we got a we got a we got the um, the uh, the the oh God, what's the word? The forecast, sorry, geez. Yeah, so you've got, so we had the ocean abundance last year of 279 minus the escapement minimum of 122 minus the escapement minimum of the Klamath Trinity minus 15% river harvest, which that's about 18,000 fish. And then minus the KT river harvest, which is 1,250 fish, which is a very, very small quota that they're allowed to up there. Uh, mm -hmm. but you're, you're basically talking, you have a hundred and you have 180 here, about 182,000 fish, um, between this total. Okay. So you take 279,000 now minus 182,000. Okay. And what do you get? About 190, 197,000 fish. Okay. Okay. So. Am I doing that right? No, 97,000 fish. That sounds more like it. Okay. So now you've got 97,000 fish. Now you got to take out all the other factors. Natural mortality eaten by sharks, whales, sea lions. Now you got to take out the model takes out artificial mortality, hook and line mortality. Every fish we catch, how many do we kill in the ocean that are undersized? How many does that start depleting off the model when they're three, four, and five year olds? So, so the model has just some some uh, figure that's plugged in for that. They have some some Correct. percentage. Yeah. Okay. Go on. So you got minus miscellaneous, right? And and it comes out and it it spits out a total number of you know just just use the number right now. We're just going to say tonight. It's not the correct number, but it's very close. Yeah. Of you know, somewhere somewhere around there, just the ninety seven thousand we're just going to use for right now, okay? Yeah. Now they now they say okay, we have ninety thousand paper ninety seven thousand paper fish. That's the first thing we figure out in the SAS, and then we start the ocean harvest model. Now we're at PFMC, and everyone's sitting here going, when we're in the room March second, the four of us are thinking about okay, we've already figured all this out in our heads. And we already know, here's how many fish we have for the whole ocean. Commercial, recreation, charter boat, everyone. And if we go over that 97,000, the only explanation for that is two things. One, we're catching some of these 122,000 or some of these 40,000 escapement fish that we are supposed to send back. Or it means this abundance number was completely off and it's too low. Yeah. And there's a lot more fish in the ocean than we projected. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Okay. Do so we, do you want to answer questions now before we go into the actual ocean harvest model? Now let's just, let's get this, let's blast through this as fast as we can. So we don't lose uh, people getting too, too uh, deep into this. And then we'll start answering questions because I'm sure lots of people have, I mean, yeah, they're lining up here. So, um, okay. So set us a season. I, uh, no, Kenny, the, uh, the, excuse me. Yeah. Kenny, you're right. I actually messed up. Kenny priest commented in the 279 actually doesn't count the Klamath fish. Kenny, Kenny's uh, actually correct. Uh, we've, we did not add the three-year-olds in here for, uh, the Klamath because we, at, we minus escapement in here. So I don't want to confuse everyone, but we have to come over here and we have to first add the amount of three-year-olds that were last year for the Klamath. Kenny, I don't know if you have that number off the top of your head, but I want to say it's like a hundred and was it a hundred and something thousand last year, but we have to add that in because this is SAC escapement and we did not add in the uh, Trinity Klamath escapement because we did minus it out of here. 
and here. So we have to add that number here, and that's why this number did not look correct to me. Um, so we will do that now. I apologize. There's so many numbers going on trying to write them all down for you guys. Um, yeah. So we are at, I will tell you right now what, what it is. Just got to look it up for a quick second. Somebody might chat it real quick. I know Kenny Priest knows it. We always talk about it every year at the meeting. All right. Klamath was, that's age four. Where are we? Um, well, okay. Go ahead and dig that up. I don't want to get too caught up in all this. Well, yeah, I don't want to confuse everyone, but I want to give at least an accurate number of exactly what was the three and four year olds. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll wait till Kenny gives me that number. Uh, I know he's got it. I'm looking, I'm looking it up too. It's somewhere right in here. Okay. So do what you did last night on the, uh, our board call that just kind of the, the synopsis version of this, um, because, it gets really convoluted. I mean, I don't know how you guys keep track of all this stuff. It's just crazy. But yeah. we, we, once you start get... getting involved, it just starts uh, consuming your life. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get down to kind of the discrepancy that uh, you were showing us last night uh, um, and how kind of we got there and what we need to do about that. Okay. Um, yeah, we can do that. I'm in the actual files and I'm apologize. I do not have that number for you um, accurately because I should have had that in this. Uh, well, in the I, meantime, I'll give the website here for that meeting coming up on March 2nd. And then also uh, remember it's from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. I wonder when the public comment part is going to be on there. All right, um, there we go. So it was a hundred and... Um, 135,000 three-year-olds and 45,000 four-year-olds. So 170, 180, um, 180, 190, like one or 181, we're going to say. So 181,000 for the total abundance for the Klamath. Okay. So just to recap, you have 279 out of the SAC system, not counting the McCollumy hatchery. Right. This is called the SI index. Then you have 122,000 out of that one, that 279 that have to come home. And then you in the Klamath, you have 181,000 total fish, three, four, and five year olds based on age based assessment. So that's and the that's the forecast for the Klamath Trinity KMZ, Klamath Management Zone Ocean Fish 181. Correct. That's the total okay. abundance. Okay. And then you have 40,000 that come off of this. And then you have Sac River Harvest, KT River Harvest. And then you've also got Oregon Commercial and Rec Harvest on our stocks, mm -hmm. which, which is a lot more than people think because our sack fish and feather fish typically nice. used to run all the way up to Coos Bay and run yep. down the Oregon coast and a lot of them get caught by Oregon fishermen. Yep. Yep. Okay. So let's, we're, we're, we're getting off track here. So let's, let's just show these numbers and the big discrepancy that we have. Okay. Well, so the, the end of the game was, is that, um, you know, the model, the model said at the end of the day, the model predicted, the model predict was that the ocean would catch somewhere around 60 or 68 or 70,000 um fish and the That's rec sector anchor. was going to catch 45,000 or 40,000 fish somewhere around there so yeah. about a total of 110,000 um harvest total Okay, so the models predicting 110,000 fish would be harvested by all the user groups out in the ocean. 
Yeah, roughly, roughly okay. speaking. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so then what happened? Um, so what happened was, I will uh, share my screen. So you have the four zones that, oops, this is the preseason. So you have the four zones here, the Klamath up top, the KMZ, Fort Bragg, San Francisco, and Monterey south to the San Diego border. Right. So the bulk of the fish that come back to the sack and come here to the valley, most of the fish stay in San Francisco, Monterey, our winter run are all down here. And a lot of those uh, net pin fish and truck fish hang out around out in here. But our natural spawner fish used to come out along here and then they'd come back down like this. Um, but when you come all the way down to what happened because of the way we had to shape the seasons, um, the commercial fleet last year caught 202,000, mm -hmm. 855 fish. And the recreational fishery caught 53,000. That's charter boats and all wreck boats. And this number is, of course, an estimate. This number is very accurate because they're required to turn in their landings and they're counted monthly. But uh, this number is an extrapolated number that we don't know how accurate it is right. long term. But a lot of people think that it's pretty accurate uh, that I've talked to because there's a lot of code wire tag monitoring. Right. And the Ocean Salmon Project does a really good job of getting a really good sense on the main ports of uh, who's catching what, but there's no way to track it. Okay. Know, so, everything. so, um, so they, they, uh, going back to your original screen there, they forecasted 110,000 would be harvested. And instead I'm looking at the, the numbers there, it was like 250,000. Yeah, it was about 250,000. So it was, um, you know, it was a lot more fish than than what was predicted. I think that this might have been a little high on this prediction, actually. I think that it, these numbers were a little lower, but, um, you know, give or take. Now, you've got to remember, though, which a lot of people don't understand. There's even people in the industry that just don't understand this, that this number is all fish that were caught by the commercial fleet. So it's every fish. It's organ fish, rogue fish. Uh, Klamath fish, Trinity fish, sack fish, McCallamy fish, net pin fish. So you've got to take all the McCallamy fish out of here first. And a lot of the, some of the net pin fish, all the enhancement fish for salmon stamp and for the okay. fleet that they produce specifically through salmon stamp, you got to take all those fish out and out of this number too, <clears throat> because okay, that getting, doesn't. <laughs> we're getting confusing here. Okay. So let, let's get, get bottom line here. Bottom line, well, let's get to some comments. JD, I think that that's why they do it this way is it's very confusing so no one can track it and understand it. Ah, now there you get to it. So, so the bottom line is we, the, the, there's at least the way I'm reading that is shouldn't be surprised that uh, the, the inland fisheries have been so poor when the, the ocean in this case uh, they got what looked like what 150,000 uh, uh, over <laughs> over what they were forecasted to catch, and 150,000 extra fish up the river would make a huge difference. So uh, yeah, sounds I mean, like we've, we've got a disconnect there somehow. We 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 we've got a disconnect, but at the same time, you know, it, it's the hardest thing to sit there and we we sit there and watch the ocean brethren. We've seen the commercial fleet just take a slacking. I mean, they used to have over a thousand boats. I think they had like 400 boats that even have permits now or 500 boats that sure. have permits, but three quarters of them aren't fishing because they've been put out of business themselves. Right. Uh, you know, there's, there's a few, you know, I think they say there's like 50 boats that catch the majority of the fish for the year. So yep. it's not like we're talking tons of people. They're just hardworking people that are trying to make a living and, uh, it's it's unfortunate the position they're put in. Uh, they're even paying into the system through Salmon Stamp and many other programs trying to get some fish out into the ocean. But the amount of fish that are being produced naturally in our rivers because of water condition is so terrible that if we don't supplement and mitigate that with hatchery production and triple or you know quadruple hatchery production now, 
we we won't have a fishery anymore because everyone right. in the ocean wants to catch their fish and I don't blame them. But right. at the same time, the river is just being destroyed. Yeah, you and, gotta have something to come back. Yeah, and then you've so, got to have water and habitat to come back to. And that's what a lot of ocean fishermen say is, why do we want to let extra fish come back to the river when they don't have water and they're dying of thiamine in the river and dying of sea shasta because of drought? And, you know, so there's a there's a double-edged sword there. But yes, we have to be more diligent about our escapement. And we have to make sure that we're not always managing to the minimum because we see what managing to the minimum has done. 75% of the time, we're going to miss escapement and have a horrible fishery inland. That's and that can't sustain itself. Okay, so that leads us to questions. That well, yeah, the meeting on March second. Again, if you have any uh, anything you want to share with the uh, with the powers that be, uh, it's kind of speak now or forever uh, keep your peace because um, they they kind of keep doing it the same way and they need to hear from you if you if you're a uh, any ocean or uh, inland fisher person. Uh, they need to hear the struggles because the fishing, I mean, obviously the river is well documented that the fishing is just absolutely abysmal and has been for, gosh, more than a decade now, really. Um, and the ocean has had its ups and downs, but it's it's nowhere near what it used to be back in the heyday when those party boats out of the Golden Gate would go two or three trips a day and limit 30 guys out each trip. So um, if, if you are interested in the future of the salmon fishery in in california you need to get on here and tell these people that hey we need more fish and i you know we can fight the water wars all day long and and that's that's a whole nother animal but bottom line is if they raise more chinook now there'll be more chinook for everybody to catch right so that's right. um so come Jenny, on I, oh, I just ahead. I just emailed you real quick. If you check your email and you can share your screen for the salmon flyer, it just came out yesterday from the state. And then that way people can uh, screenshot it um, okay. and, 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 and people can see it right there on your chat. Um, my pay grade, but I'll try it. Um, okay. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's get to some uh, questions. We got a bunch of people backed up here. So here we go. Um and let's let's try to you know <laughs> a couple sentences or or fewer here uh, just so we can get to everybody. Um, so we got uh, Brian McGinty. What's up, hey Brian? How you doing? He's an old sack salmon fisherman. Uh, North Island fishing. Hello. <laughs> We're getting a lot of that here. Let's see what else. What's up, guys from Ravensdale, Washington? I don't even know where Ravensdale is. Um, Oh, we got British Columbia. Good evening. Howdy. Okay. We got, we got all kinds of stuff here <laughs> off topic here, but the sportsman's expo this year, Cal Expo sucked <laughs> and I hope they improve it. Uh, okay. Da, 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 da. Go. We got a lot. Of, okay. Here we go. Dave. I haven't caught a Jack or even witnessed that many caught in the last five years. I would agree with that. Um, the Jack fishing has been, well, just, it's been salmon fishing in general has been sucky in the Valley. Um, let's see, Kenny Priest, for Jack the Returns of the River, CDFW, estimates another 18 stayed in the ocean to become three-year-olds. And that, that's a good, uh, good explanation for why Jack counts, because Jacks are a fish that comes in a year or two early, prematurely. And, uh, so if you have a bunch of Jacks in the river, the thought is, and not all the biologists agree with this, but, um, they, the thought is that. If there's a bunch that came back as jacks, that means there's a bunch out in the ocean. Okay. Yeah, so to, just this. to do it, do a quick variable on that. For every thousand jacks we get back, then roughly eighteen thousand three-year-olds still exist. So that's what that is predicting. So old uh, tired American says they don't have any way of recording how many salmon are harvest, but they're coming up with numbers of escapement. Am I the only one taking crazy pills? <laughs> So they have a way of recording to the best of their ability on the Feather River. It's a mark recapture method on um, on the American and on the SAC. They're doing uh, red surveys uh, for natural spawners through the uh, Bureau of Reclamation and U.S. Fish and Wildlife, as well as CDFW on the American. And then you've got uh, code wire tags and then the Creel survey. But 
you know, the general theory is that on the sack is that we catch 15% of whatever comes home. That's their theory. So if a 122,000 is what the model says is going to come home, we're going to catch 18,000, which means you got to let 140,000 come home off the model. So um, in order to have 18,000 in the sack and 122 minimum on escapement, so that means 140 got to come into the rivers to, to meet that. And then the, the Klamath Trinity has got a similar situation as well. It's difficult though. <laughs> We lose JD. <laughs> All right. I'm back, I think. Yep. Sorry, I, I don't know. Technical difficulties. All right. Were you uh there I am? Yep, I lost am. the host. <laughs> <laughs> you were still there? That's good. Yeah, okay. I was still here. I was panicking. <laughs> All right, so I assume you answered that question. Uh, let's go on here. Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, okay. Lots of just, uh, da, 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 da. JJ says CDFW is killing sport of fishing. Yeah, there's, there's something that, okay. Uh, Tina says, why is such a low number acceptable of 279? Yeah, Tina, that's a great question. So back in the eighties, nineties and two early two thousands until 2004, we were seeing escapement of 1.1 million, 1.5 million, 1.8 million out in the ocean, just the Sacramento. And then the Klamath, we were seeing five, six, eight, eight hundred thousand 800,000 up there too. And even million abundance up, up there in that system as well. I mean, at one time, I think JD, they said the eel ran a million Chinook. Yeah, I know. Um, you know, it's just cra crazy. I mean, crazy numbers were back in the day. There was millions of fish in abundance every single year. You just physically couldn't catch them. And so right. when you get abundances over about 1.2 million, when you get over 1.2 million fish, you can go fish every day and they, they just can't catch them all. No one can right. catch them all. And so many fish will, will make it back to the rivers that even the inland anglers can't catch them all. And tons of fish spawn, tons of fish go back to the hatchery, and everyone wins. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, uh, Dan Bacher, who's been uh, hard at work fighting for the fisheries for eons, uh, is there any preliminary estimate of Sacramento Klamath Fall Chinook escapement yet for this year, I assume? There's, there's no official numbers out, and no one's willing to share any official numbers. But the sense is, is that when the when the department's quiet, we missed it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's. Simple. I mean, it's like it's like we've never played poker before. It's like you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but... you know, there's no poker face. You've got to know that if the department's quiet about what's going on, and we all know what happened last year and the year before, it was terrible. So right. we missed escapement in the sack uh the klamath had a little bit better and than than expected right and diamond uh, i hate to tell you but there might not even be a season buddy so uh, i mean it's it's okay. early yet but uh, uh okay. don't be shocked because of the aforementioned uh 75 percent miss escapement over the last 15 years that it's, I, I it's just, not a go ahead i would just say to diamond that if it's in the ocean you know, more than likely everyone will advocate for a two fish day because of the gas and fuel and everything. Sure. Always. I haven't heard the ocean go into one fish and I heard it was suggested a long, long time ago, but two fish is normally what everyone say, but in the public process, you can always give your input to the PFMC. Um, but in the river, um, after PFMC in April, then it's analyzed um, how many fish should be uh, caught um, and what the what the escapement and return numbers will be, and that could be one or two fish inland, or could be no fishery. Okay. Uh, couldn't this all be avoided by just raising egg take quotas and releasing more fish? Well, yeah, that's <laughs> that's what we've been talking about, um, Will. And and unfortunately, it's not that simple. It's simple to us, but um, there's a lot of factors going into that that. Uh, the powers that be are fighting that, and uh, um, <laughs> we'll have to get into that one another time. But yeah, that's when 
the, the bottom line for me is, you know, right now they, they are saying hatchery fish are inferior. They want to raise fewer and fewer of them. And, um, and this whole thing to go back to wild fish, but when they built the hatcheries in the fifties to mitigate for the last, uh, mitigate for the loss of the spawning habitat that was upstream of all the big dams, um, they, they acknowledged right then and there that wild fish weren't going to be around much longer. So now they're reneging on that. And, and that's what we're trying to, trying to understand. Okay. Moving on. Cause we got a bunch of them here. Mark Lynn, American river rat. What's he got to say? Are uh, the net pin fish GGSA have been raising, making it back to freshwater? And are they being tagged to show whether uh, they're making it back to Central Valley Rivers? Or is general consensus that they're just supplementing the ocean and commercial recreational harvest to take pressure off hatchery stocks? It's a good question, Mark. Okay, so that's a lot to unpack, Mark. <laughs> I mean, um, well, not yeah. just a simple question. So I'll start and say this, our, our water conditions are, are more than not the majority of the time when we're trying to release fish into the rivers, the conditions are poor. We have no derived nutrients. We have no car carcasses from natural spawning fish dying. So there's no food in the system. Hot there's temperatures. hot temperatures, sediment, armored gravel. Everything is against natural spawning fish in the rivers right now. Everything is against them. So I'll start there and saying, so we, you know, um, groups like G GGSA and other uh, ocean groups have advocated to truck the fish to get them further, further away from the hatcheries in order to create survival rate as survival goes up hopefully more fish will come back and they contribute to escapement and inland fishery and everything else. So you've got to have fish survive first. Otherwise they won't actually make it back to the river. So the answer is a lot to unpack with when it comes to the net pens, but there are certain net pens that produce better than others. And then the next year it will flop. So it's just, it's really difficult to try to answer all of that, but yes and no. It would be my answer to that question. There are many times to where trucked fish from certain hatcheries, particularly the feather, do very well on survival and returning escapement. But there's also tons of examples of the Nimbus and the McCallamy hatchery just having huge stray rates. And we know if we truck fish from Coleman, they're gone. They're lost. Uh, 100%, 98%. And that's what the numbers show. Yep. Uh, I got one. Let's talk about the Indians illegally gill netting the Smith River and fishing game does nothing. Well, that's a complicated one because fishing game technically has no jurisdiction uh, on on native lands because it's their own um, sovereign nation. So, um, and I, I think that's going to be happening more and more coming up. That's kind of the word I'm getting from the North Coast. But that that one's for another time. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? I think if we were able to cut out fishing for two years, you'd be able to fish again, but allow the salmon population to rebound. Um, you know, that's that's really not addressing the issue, though. Um, it's the habitat loss uh, that really, really has uh, destroyed these fisheries. So, um, yeah, sure, you'd have a few more come back, but that wouldn't uh, wouldn't help in the the long, long run, I don't think. JD, I would say that biologists would agree with you on that too. Um, the top biologists have said that fishing is not the problem um, of creating, you know, more fish. Uh, we've got to have that habitat water or huge hatchery supplementation um, in order to even try to start boosting abundances past two, three, four hundred thousand total fish in the ocean. But fish, cutting out fishing is not going to solve it long term. Yeah. Uh, am I the only one that says the moke has been a joke the last few years? No. Um, which is weird because the moke and Bill Smith down there, those guys have been doing such a good job. They had Great that job. year a couple years ago where they had 20,000 fish up that little creek. Yep. I think a lot of it has to do with the moke hasn't had any water in it. And um, that that's certainly not helping the McCullamy. I don't know if you know anything else about that. What's uh, what's been up with the moke, but it's, it's definitely has not been it's a uh, grand self. Lately. I would just I would just say to Kevin that 
The only way you know the McCollum is going to have fish in it is if there's water running down it. If there's no water running down it in October, November, fish are going to stray everywhere. They're going to go up every creek and people in Walnut Creek and Alameda Creek and Napa and everybody are going to be catching random salmon here and there and they're going to go everywhere. Um, but they're not going to go back to the moak. You've got to have that water coming back or those fish won't smell it. But Bill Smith and his crew have done a phenomenal job and is yeah. probably a main, main reason that the commercial fleet and ocean fishery even exists currently right now. Indeed. Uh, we've got a couple guys talking about salmon cars. I'm trying to, sorry guys, we can't get to everybody because there's so many in here, but salmon cards probably aren't going to be a thing. Uh, the state's not really into that kind of stuff these days. Um, let's see. Now the 360, the 365 license legislation passed last year, which, uh, our organization supported for the past number of years. And in that legislation, it calls for electronic licenses finally. So by 2023, we should all be on electronic app licenses by 2024. We should be able to buy our licenses and everything through the app. And by 2025, we should be doing all of our steelhead cards, salmon cards and everything else on the app electronically so uh by 2025 the state that uh, is, is known for the silicon valley and all the tech is finally getting on board that's that's amazing to me um let's see mart oh my goodness i haven't seen you guys a long time come fishing at tahoe or pyramid miss you guys thanks for checking in um uh, let's see Tired American. He's on fire. Will there be discussions with California farmers early this year for water reduction since our water resources aren't great again? Probably. Um, yeah, they're, they're still under the 1914 curtailments. The farmers in the North Sac Valley are under the worst water restrictions right now than they ever have been um, in the history of California. And it's going to be worse uh, with the dry weather and 87 degrees coming to Redding the next three, four days. Um, you're, you're talking... This is not good. If we don't get rain in March, we're going to be lower water reservoirs than we were last year. And last year was just terrible. So uh, I think Shasta is 30 feet lower than it was last year. It's 130 feet down total right now. And Orville's 155 feet total down. Which is insane considering that storm we had in December. I mean, I had, you know, 19 feet in one month of snow up here at my house. And, and, and we haven't seen a flake since Christmas. Anyway, um, my wife yeah. tells me I should not stress about that because I can't control it. And I'm going to have to start listening to her on that. <laughs> Larry Nevis says, uh, no, sorry. Uh, so what happened? Yeah, here's another harvest card thing. And well, my take on that is yes. If, if people actually filled them out, um, <laughs> And there's, there's always that uh, aspect to it. Um, what, what say you? I, I just don't know what the correct answer is. And, you know, I, I'm not one to critique, you know, um, how we, how we are going to do it. I just know that the way that we're doing it is not working. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've provided, I've provided solutions in the past. We've recommended the harvest report card. We've recommended different surveys. We've recommended, you know, what, you know, a lot of people are fear of the word quota. Um, a lot of fisheries, ocean fisheries in Oregon and Washington use quotas. We don't use those in California. We use days on the water and that relates to a certain amount of fish caught. Um, but mm -hmm. it's what we need to make sure we do is put like a stop loss. If any of you have ever traded stocks or options or something and you're buying a risky play, you buy into it, but you put a stop loss in it. So if it goes down a certain percentage, five or 10%, if you go over a certain threshold, then you go, oh, watch out. We got to stop it because we're going too much. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that if we miscalculated abundance by two, three hundred thousand fish, um, you could shut down a fishery that could catch a lot of fish, providing food for families, restaurants, processors and many other people or translate to a huge river return and fishery inland. Um, right. So you that's your consideration. Yeah. Uh, Mike Patton, thank you from Lake Almanor. Thanks, Mike. Um, let's see what else we got. More, uh, this is a <laughs> that's a uh, <laughs> we're working on it. The yeah. commercial fleet, the commercial fleet, the charter boat fleet, and our group, 
represent the entire salmon industry for all the people that work for salmon and make money off salmon. And so from the industry perspective, our groups have combined between the Golden Gate Fishing Association and Pacific Coast uh, Fishermen's Federation for the commercial fleet and NorCal Guides Inland. And we're meeting with everyone finally on March 4th to try to have um, dialogue on doubling or tripling hatchery production immediately because they've already put most of us out of business and the ocean's just next. And yep. that's what that's why we've been sounding the alarm bell because even the head biologist told us that we knew the ocean, the, the river fishery would be first. Once we saw the river fishery completely tank multiple years in a row, that's only the signal that here comes the rest of it. The only yeah, reason duh. it's staying, staying afloat is because of all the trucking. If you right. take away the trucking, the fishery's gone. Everyone's out of business. Yep. Nobody's fishing for recreational purposes. The whole thing's gone. Uh, yep. But people don't understand that. We're, we're, we're playing with fire the way that we're managing the system and the way that we're, we're playing God. And uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Bob Spar says, with the model being so far off, why doesn't Fish and Wildlife put a cap on the number of fish the commercial fleet can catch? Every other West Coast state does. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of different negotiations that go on in other states between tribes, between recreation fisheries, charter boat fisheries, commercial fisheries. They're all allocated certain numbers of fish. A lot of those fisheries are quota fisheries to where they might say, you know, hey, we, we're allowed to catch 10,000 of this stock. We're allowed to catch 20,000 cohos and we're allowed to catch 5,000, you know, toolies or whatever. And so then they manage their fisheries according to that. And every week they might have a cap that could be landed in a week, but that's all up to the commercial fleet. That's up to them. You know, um, my role on the Pacific Fisheries Management Council is I can't tell them how to run their fishery. Um, I can only help to give suggestions to where we can as the stock as a whole. Um, and to support it as a whole to make sure that we're all fishing for recreational purposes. My job is to fight for all of you as sports men and women and families that want to go out and angle. I'm trying to fight for you to make sure that you have a fishery in the ocean and have a fishery inland. Right. Um, we need more steelhead too, says Big Gant 78. Um, our runs are garbage. Our river's dying. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Yes. We're Agreed. working on it. Yep, we're gonna we're gonna really get into that this year too. So stand by. Um, this is uh, kind of going along with what Bob was saying, um, and you you sort of addressed that already. Uh, thanks for that, Brad. Uh, speaking of Bob, why do we still have a credit card fishery in the ocean? This is just a manipulation of numbers to me. Now, give give people the background on the 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 term credit card fishery. A lot of people don't understand this, and I didn't either. So um, I was ignorant as can be on this. And um, I even warned everyone again on this last year, and everyone told me I didn't know what I was talking about. And some people um, like to think that experience trumps knowledge and intelligence. Um, sometimes it can. Um, but um, I, I will say that a credit card fishery, the season of a salmon's life is September 1, to August 31. That's their life cycle of how they're managed. September 1 to August 31 for fall Chinook. Okay, fall run Chinook. September 1 to August 31. So you fish in the ocean all the way until August 31 in the ocean. As soon as you start September 1st, all those fish caught in September by the commercial and recreational fleet and the fish in October and the fish in November are on a credit card. You're borrowing fish from next year. So you're catching next year's fish and they're minus right off the top of the abundance. So if, you're, if your abundance is 300,000, but last year in September and October, we caught 30,000 fish. Guess what? That abundance just got cut by 10%. Now you start at 270. So that's right. a credit card fishery. It's been going on for years. It also puts the fleet right in front of San Francisco in September and October, right when 
all the fish are trying to come in and it seems that our runs are going later and later because we have such poor water conditions right. that the fish are waiting until the last minute and you're seeing the run timing shift according to water policy and we've seen this happen with the spring run as also yep um da, 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 let's see brad says mark fish yeah, that's been brought up a lot, and CDFW doesn't seem to be real interested in uh, mark and fish, and they'll they'll say that it's uh, you know they raise so many that uh, even the the county or the clipping machines would be overwhelmed. But um, I would say they're not raising that many anymore. So <laughs> yeah, the main the main problem with raising marking all fish and clipping every adipose fin is. As soon as a hatchery fish returns and goes and spawns in the river, now you've got a bunch of fish with fins, and they call them wild fish. Right. Well, they're not wild fish. They're just hatchery strays, first generation, second generation, third generation, mm -hmm. when in fact the lead biologist from NOAA Fisheries has already admitted that every stock in the Sacramento Valley has one out of four parents are from hatchery stock. So everything has hatchery influence in it. There is no pure strain wild jurassic chinook salmon in the sac valley it just doesn't exist anymore Which so been but, saying forever <laughs> right but the people are trying to manage it like we have this purebred wild stock and they start arguing scientific terms on fitness and start talking things that go over everyone's heads says h hgmps and hsrg and all these things that make you spend hundreds of hours trying to understand the logic behind it but they forgot the common sense and the <laughs> real the realism of no water and dams and uh, many other things that are, are, yep. are preventing these salmon from ever rebounding. We have yep. to raise hatchery production. We have to put these fish in the river in new areas and recolonize these areas and then give them some proper water so they can start spawning again. Yep, yep. Dave Klingman, what's your opinion about barging salmon out to the ocean to bypass the Delta? I think that, you know, it's McCullumy's done some of that with good results, Dave. And um, I, you know, I think it's, well, the Columbia did it with not such great results. Um, so it, it's hard to say. Um, I think, and, and there's been a few pilot studies on the SAC, haven't there, on that? I don't yeah, know the Feather the... River did it for a few years from Verona down. And uh, they found some good, good information, but they were seeing survival rates way higher from fish that were trucked to the West Delta, West Bay, uh, Mare Island, and uh, Fort Baker. Fort Baker has really high survival compared to some of the other areas. But the releases, it's actually more about, like, I think when the release is done, how many days consecutive, was there yeah. avian predation, was there striped bass predation or other type of predation because yep. if you get cormorants on the bridge, they'll destroy that stock so fast, faster than any striped bass school. Yep. Frank Emerson, how about legislation to require hatchery carcasses and unused salmon to be put back in the river for nutrients? We've been, uh, we've been discussing that and it's ridiculous that uh, I actually had a biologist in a meeting with CDFW tell me that we had a carcass problem. Mm -hmm. And I said, a carcass problem? Oh, yeah. Back in the early 2000s, we had so many salmon that there were, you know, we couldn't put them all back in the river. And I said, OK, um, isn't that as God and Mother Nature herself intended? Well, you know, and it's so it's that's a long story. And if you I'm sure you've seen our movie Unspawn, but that'll tell you more about what's going on with that. And I'll give you that link right here go to youtube and check that out um you'll get more on that but yes you're absolutely right we we have no carcasses left in the rivers and uh i remember you know not even as a kid just 20 years ago going steelhead fishing in the fall on the feather or the american would be disgusting wading out through the the goo quagmire of uh of salmon on both sides of the river that were dead and you just don't see that anymore and it's really it's really disconcerting and, and <laughs> you wonder why things aren't going well okay fish hunter why do the coleman fish get lost at such a high rate compared to other hatcheries that's a great question that is a great question fish hunter and the answer is because of the smell of imprinting water 
So salmon are known to imprint at a few stages in their life. Uh, one, when they're in the egg and the eye, when the eye pops in the egg, that's called the eyed stage. Mm -hmm. and, then the, and then the next stage is uh, either when they're put in raceways or they're, you know, fry. And then when they smolt, and the smolt is when they are, they are ready for salt water. And our department, uh, federal and state government, Coleman specifically, the federal government, U.S. Fish and Wildlife that operate that hatchery. They've been raising the smolt since 1999, and they got rid of the fry program. And until since 1999, they've been raising half as many fish, but they've been raising them to a larger size. And that way they can just get flushed straight down the river really fast and go straight out into the salt water. And they're ready to go rather than having them mill around the river for four or five months and make their way out slowly because of uh, the conditions, the water conditions, the food that are derived nutrients and all the other stuff that we were talking about. So uh, they stray because when they imprint and they get released at Battle Creek as a smolt and they start swimming down, they smell Battle Creek. Then they go down the sack. Then they smell all the tributaries all the way down. Then the feather comes in with the Yuba and all that smell. Then the American with all that smell. Then they come down the San Joaquin and all that smell and the McCallamy. And then, then they get through, forged uh, out. Yeah. Yeah. And sucked nothing. into the Delta pumps and down, yep. down the California aqueduct. Um, yep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they have a challenge. They've got a huge challenge. And if, if they get all the way out, which is it, it's less, less than 1% returning um, when they come back, um, they've got to get to the sack and then they smell their way all the way home. And if they're not released at battle Creek, to learn that way all the way down with that imprinting and that smell, as well as a geomagnetic pulse that they get while they're out in the ocean, which is what scientists believe get them around the world when they're traveling on their migrational routes. Um, then if they truck them all the way down, they don't smell any of that water and they don't know how to get home. So they just turn to the best available water. Right. Um, our man, Bob Spar has another, whoops, where'd it go? What can we do at the March 2nd meeting that will help our inland fisheries since this is a meeting dealing mostly with ocean regulations? Another good question by Bob. Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, I would just say to show up because nobody shows up from inland fisheries at these March 2nd meeting. It's primarily an ocean meeting. But the problem is, is that if you're not involved at this meeting and you don't give your feedback from what you're seeing on the inland fishery, it's never going to get any better. I've been, I've been the voice for years now going to this meeting and advocating for our 5,000 members and it's falling on deaf ears because I'm one person fighting for an inland fishery and there's no one else there. No one. It's all ocean people. And so it just, okay, James. Yep. All right. Thanks. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, you're great. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, and it's over. It's, it's, uh, you know, I, I want, I want everyone to understand that You've got to voice your opinion if you want to be heard. And this is a public process. And so we're calling all, all hands on deck. This is it. Because if you don't come now, there's just not going to be a fishery anymore. I mean, ever again, it's going to get managed to the minimum. There's going to be horrible runs coming back. And unless you get really, really, really lucky, uh, there's just not going to be more than 200,000 fish ever returning to our rivers. It's always going to be the dismal 100,000, 90,000, 80,000, 110,000, 122,000. It's just never going to be good again. And I don't want that to happen for my kids, grandkids, and all of your kids and grandkids. And so I'm saying no, enough's enough. We need to be responsible. We need to be accurate. If we're government employees, we need to be reporting the correct numbers and we need to be doing and advocating for what's correct. We don't need to be managing because of we're fear of uh, management coming down on us or political pressures or anything else. We need to do what's right. And it's very frustrating because we know there's a lot of politics involved. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are good people that work for the department. There are some really good people that work Absolutely. for the department yeah. and their hands are tied. They're scared to speak out and they'll Thanks call off yep. the record, but they'll never tell you on the record because they're fear that they're going to get fired. They've been told there's been supervisors that tell people that if they tell me information or others information that they'll get fired. I mean, 
It's ridiculous. This is a transparent process. The government works for the people. Remember that, everyone. And <laughs> you can stand up and you can say enough's enough and you can show up at this meeting and voice your opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I think they need to hear uh, from us, especially if you've been the only guy there fighting the fight. Um, they just think, oh, I guess everything's fine in the river. One guy showed up. But if, if uh, you know, like our striper meeting, when we filled the room with 300 people, they all of a sudden went, oh, oh OK. So, again, March 2nd, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We don't know when the public comment period will be. But if you go back to that um, website that I had there, uh, there's more info there. And um, I think that's a, probably a good place to uh, to leave it. we got a few more comments in there and questions that have kind of kind of doing the same uh a lot of the same stuff here i'm just kind of scanning through them but uh i think you know let's let's end on that note where uh the call to action and uh would love to see you guys all out there and again if you can't make it uh do you know james how to submit a public comment uh, yeah, I'm actually pulling it up for you right now. Because okay. that's actually uh, what I have to do because I'm not in town that day. Yeah, so um, you can do a public comment. That's completely okay. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, here we go. And. Wow. I'm going to try to find, there it is. It's that one. Like something out of Pink Floyd, the wall right there. How's that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, zoom in a little more if you can. Okay. It's 150% right there. Okay. Uh, those of us with older eyes. Okay. So there you go. You can visit the department's ocean salmon webpage. And when I clicked on that, it just takes you to that uh, address that I had before, which was right here. And, uh, um, you just kind of got to like, like most government websites, you gotta, you gotta do a little fishing when you get there. But, uh, um, and then looks like maybe you could, can you send, um, you go back for a second there. There was an email address. Ocean salmon at wildlife.ca.gov. All right. Let me see if I can, uh, make that real quick. Ocean salmon at wildlife.ca.gov. Ocean salmon at wildlife.ca.gov. Uh, probably spelled that wrong in my speed typing, but let's uh, get it up there. So that's where you can submit comments. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. So I think that's where you would have to ask who you send comments to, but I. Yeah. Um, that's Catherine. I think her, her, she'll contact that the ocean salmon project, but they'll monitor that and give you who you can submit comments to if you can't attend the meeting. But you know, it's, um, when I'm there, um, in the beginning of the meeting, I'm there representing, um, uh, all of our guides, as well as all of our representatives, our membership, you know, we're representing over 5,000 people now, um, mm -hmm. that fish the ocean and fish the, um, and fish. I represent a lot of uh, six pack boats that are uh, lifetime members and big members of ours, as well as a lot of ocean fishermen. So we represent actual business out in the ocean as well. Um, and our organization will advocate for everyone to make sure that we have access and opportunity. Um, but then when the meeting gets later in the day, then I put my PFMC hat on and then I'm wearing my hat as the PFMC representative. And from there, all I'm doing is I'm listening to everyone in the public of how they want their season shaped for the sport and, and recreation fishery and what they want. And so there's going to be ample times to make comments. They'll start off with talking about the Sacramento River and what happened last year and what abundance is for next year. And then they'll say, does anyone have any questions? Then they'll talk about the Klamath and, and, and what happened on the Klamath and, and are there any questions? Then they'll talk about um, you know, the total uh, fishery of last year, what happened out in the ocean for commercial and rec, any questions then. And then after that, then the PFMC members will sit up in the front and then the members of the public will uh, give their opinions on what they want to see and how the season should be crafted in order to have fisheries for all. So who, so it's 10 to four. And I know you, you don't know the answer to this, but 
obviously there's a lot of people who can't just tune in for the whole whole time. So um, you got any tips on when they might tune in? Well, if you want to comment to the four PFMC members specifically about the season setting process, that normally takes place the last hour between three and four, generally okay. speaking. So I would say three o'clock would be your target, maybe 2.30. Yeah. Um, if you want to be there for the beginning where they give you all the numbers and, you know, say, I believe you, that Creole number from the river is too high or too low, or you want to comment on what you saw and what you believe is honest on the sack or the Klamath, then you might want to tune in early in the first hour from 10 to 11. And that's generally when that will go. It's like half an hour per presentation, short question and answers on that. And it will be the second year. It's an all zoom meeting. So it might sl be slower. Yeah. And that, that goes with this question here. Singers ventures, where's the meeting or is it online? Yeah, it's online. And hopefully you, you caught that last bit. Um, and then we have a bunch of guys saying thanks and all that. We uh, we appreciate all of okay. you. And people always ask, hey, how can I get involved? What can I do? And uh, first of all, you can go to our website, NCGS. Huh, easy for me to say. It says it right there. You just, just read it there. <laughs> .org. And um, I, I've said this a million times, but people always come up to us and say, hey, I want to get involved. I'm, I'm busy and you know I don't have a whole lot of time. Best thing you can do is spend 20 bucks. Too. Is that what it's still still 20 bucks? Yep. Yeah. 20 bucks for a membership. And then we can add you to our list when we go into these meetings with the state and the feds and all these fisheries managers and say, hey, we represent X number of thousand people. And and I, I still remember the day when uh, I think it was Stafford Lear. We were in one of those meetings and they go, oh, you guys represent over half of the um, licensed fishing guides in California now, huh? Hmm. I guess we've got to listen to you guys a little bit now. And, and that just keeps growing. So if every single per, I mean, if we had every salmon fisher person in California on our list, we would just mop up in there. I mean, we could do some damage. Um, but, uh, that's, that's the easiest thing you can do. And if you, you know, you want to get involved more, there's plenty that we can, uh, we can suggest, but that's, that's the easiest thing right there is just go to the website, Sign up for a membership, and uh, we're, we got a lots of uh, uh, kind of new social media stuff coming. We're going to keep people informed much better than we have in the past, and uh, so that's my little spiel on that. So join up; we'd love to have you. And and you know, if that's all you can do, that's great. It's twenty bucks. We we got your name on the list. That means you support what we're doing, and uh, that's uh, that's that's really powerful. So there's uh, there's only one point five million anglers in California left. That's it. And we're down to 275,000 hunters. That's it yeah, for the whole state yeah. of California out of 40 million people. So yeah, you you got to realize we're falling apart, you guys. Uh, yeah. We got to band together, not fight against each other. Whether mm -hmm. you're an inland, an ocean, whatever sector you are, just be truthful and honest with yourself. What are we going to do as a coalition, as a group together to make sure that we all have access to the fishery we can all go feed our families and we can all still go and make sure that we have salmon for multiple generations past us. Yeah. Well said. Well, buddy, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks to all of you out there. And I guess it's not really TV land, but uh, internet land. And um, we will, uh, before the meeting, uh, we'll probably put something else out. So stay tuned. Uh, just to keep you keep you informed what's going on and uh, sorry we didn't get to all the comments but we're running a little bit behind here so I uh, just want to say thanks to everybody thanks to you James and uh, we will talk to you all soon yeah